Hello, everybody. I am Brother Luke. Uh, welcome to this Wednesday night Bible study for the Church of the Eternally Secure, also known as CES. And tonight we are continuing the study of the book of Ephesians, and we are in chapter one. We'll begin with verse 18. So get your Bibles ready, and we'll start in just a second. Uh, let's say hello to the congregation first, and ladies first. Sister yes. Renee. Yes. Hello, beloved saints. I'm looking forward to our Bible study. Man, I love Paul's epistles. Uh, but I'm seeing there, there's some pain going on. So I want to get this off our chest. We're to bear one of those burdens, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. Uh, Chris Annie, Chris Ann, uh, or Chris Annie. I I'm not sure I pronounce it. I've always said Chris Ann. Uh, I want to pray for you. She, she needs prayers right now. Uh, and God knows her need. So let's lift her up. Also, David, he's a longtime viewer of mine. He's been with me five years. He worked the carnivals and with COVID, all the carnivals are closed. He's unemployed. So we want to pray for him and that God provide for his needs and give him the strength during this time. I also want to ask for prayers for my friend, Cindy, who's having a, a chronic pain and is having her 24th surgery soon. Uh, and to continue to pray for my son's aunt, uh, my sister-in-law, Brooke, and her health. So please, let's do that. I know usually we do prayers on Sunday, but it's never the wrong time to pray for each other. Okay. I'll pray for that, and amen. Uh, well, Brother Cripps, uh, why don't you say hello to the congregation? Hello, congregation. I hope everyone's doing well uh, tonight. It's good to see everybody. And uh, Renee, I appreciate you bringing all that out. I definitely will pray for the people involved and um, anyone else that needs prayer. Uh, just put it in the chat and one of us will uh, see it. We'll, we, I, Jen and I make a list and uh, we write, write it down uh, usually. And uh, sometimes some of the people we pray for pretty often. Excuse me, and something caught in my throat. Um, pretty often, we don't have to look at the list, but if it's new people, we just add to the list. Uh, I, I enjoy doing that. I, I, I uh, enjoy praying for other people uh, rather than for myself. If that's all possible, I don't want to be a straight-up, uh, quote-unquote, Christian narcissist. Not going for that. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the broadcast and uh, uh, probably finish this chapter up tonight and move to the next one. But... Um, so far, I'm I'm thrilled with the the uh, the new book that we started, and I'm excited uh, to learn from you guys and to learn from the Holy Spirit and uh, see what He has to say, uh, what Paul has to say tonight. Thank you. Yeah, Amen. Yeah, you know, we know we we've all read the, the book of Ephesians before. It's not sure. Really, we've never read this book, so uh, we probably read it many, many times, and so we know what's coming. And there's a lot of great stuff uh, in this book, so. I'm eager to go forward. Um, Brother Ben, will you say <laughs> hello to everybody? Yes, I'm also looking forward to the study tonight. Um, looking forward to the washing, the word, and the empowerment that the word always gives. And Ephesians is a good book, definitely, for that. So looking forward to it. Are you done? Yeah, Luke, you're muted. Okay, thanks for telling me. Still muted. All right. Um, well, let me just uh, say, if there's anybody here uh, listening now or in the chat room and you're you're here for the first time, I want to make sure you're, you're welcome. Uh, and I hope that uh, you enjoy this uh, time with us tonight and perhaps you'll want to participate again. Uh, we have a, a Sunday church service, uh, Wednesday night Bible study, and a uh, uh, Friday night fellowship program that uh, is a lot of fun. Uh, along with some other programs that uh, on some of our other channels that are affiliated. So uh, there's a, a lot here that um, I think you'll find a blessing if you uh, stick with us. All right. Uh, anything else before we go into the first verse? All right. Mm -hmm. Let's do that. Okay. Now we're a KJV first just here. So we'll read the KJV first and then discuss it. Um, verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward uh, who believe 
according to the working of his mighty power. Well, gosh, he's going to go on for the whole chapter without a period. Go more, go I'm going to stop there with just 18 and 19. Right, guys, Sister Renee. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I love this section because Paul is continuing that all of us who have trusted Christ actually are believers in the gospel. We have an inheritance. He wants us to know that. It encourages us to serve the Lord. I was going over the YouTube thing today. Oh my gosh. You the church, you're talking about a great falling away is gonna happen. It's already happened. The entire professing Christendom is in apostasy because the gospel is lost. Yep. There is only a remnant that have the foundation of the message that we have an inheritance in Christ freely given by his grace through faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus. That is it. That is all. And no one believes it. The gospel is not. If you live a good Christian life and try not to sin uh, at the end of your life, you might get it. <laughs> the gospel is Jesus Christ paid the debt you owed and God wants you as his child. He wants a big family. Mm. And so freely by his grace, he offers that you be born into his family. He gives you the spirit, which is the security deposit. It says here, the earnest of our inheritance, because we trusted in Christ. It tells us right there. We were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance. The financial term meaning security deposit where we got a partial payment with the rest to be given afterwards. And so with that being said, Paul is confirming to us that he wants us to have this knowledge and understanding of the promises we have in Jesus. This encourages the saints to live for the Lord, not fear and condemnation. God does not deal with us as under the law and as, as slaves, but as his children. And we are born into his family by faith. And so I, I believe the church is right now in the great falling away because such a few are on the right foundation. And so he's building upon here. He says that our Lord, let's go to the verse before it, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. He wants us to know the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That yes. you know what is the hope of his calling mm. and what the riches of the glory of, in, of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who who believe according mm. to the working of his mighty power. So mm. does this sound like God wants you wondering if you're saved? He wants you to have your eyes open. Yes. To the power and what God wants to give you. Yeah. Exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe. Mm. He wants you to know because you believe you are his child. He wants you to know what is ahead for you. It's supposed to encourage you to serve the Lord. If you're always looking at Christ and saying, I am a child of the king. My, and I am rich. My daddy's rich. I have the inheritance of heaven. That's my focus. And so I can serve him in joy and peace here. Mm. I don't know what this mess is that's being preached, but it is not the gospel and it is not the body of Christ and it edifies no one. It's a bunch of law and religion and it's the furthest thing from God's heart towards humanity. Amen. He loves us. He wants us to be his children and he made it easy because he himself paid the debt. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We can all say amen. Hey, congregation. Amen. Anybody? Amen. <laughs> all right. Brother Cripps, uh, do you want me to look at that in the uh, Amplify first for you? Yeah, it should be consistent. Okay. I understand what it means and I'm ready to go. But yeah, let's hear. Let's hear. What right. it says. Let's read 18 and 19 in the Amplify. It says, and I pray that the eyes of your heart, that is the very center and core of your being, may be enlightened, that is, flooded with the light by the Holy Spirit, yes. so that you will know and cherish the hope that is the divine guarantee, the confident expectation to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, that is, God's people. Wow. 
Um, I, amazing. Like, that's amazing. Uh, I like the way the Amplified put it. Uh, first, like to say that I love that uh, uh, Renee's very rarely ever like mousy and quiet, but she came uh, preaching with a, with a message tonight right out of the gate, and I appreciated everything that she said, and I agree with it as well. Um, particularly what she said ab ab about the uh, deception. And I, I don't know specifically if, if it's if it's deception, meaning uh, uh, the break or whatever. The that's that's not the right word. The um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the basically division. I, but I do know that with all the hundreds of different denominations and uh, not being of one mind, you know, the we refer to the body of Christ. Uh, but, but yet we have everybody, you know, thinking and believing different things. And, and, uh, Paul said, be of one mind. And, uh, I can't wait to see that. Um, I agree with her that there's a remnant of people that still have the gospel. I think that's very, very true. And, um, it's important to, to, to share it. It makes it all the more important for those people that are salt and light to the rest of the world to be able to, to, uh, share that with others, especially if, if everyone else has a false gospel. Um, I like what it says in 18, uh, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Um, this isn't something we can do ourselves. This is not us enlightening ourselves. It's not leaning on our own understanding. It's the Holy Spirit. I like the way the Amplified, uh, Amplified made that very, very clear. The Holy Spirit is the one. Uh, God opens your eyes and ears. Uh, it makes that makes that possible for us. So that's, that's uh, an amazing, wonderful truth. Um, also like what Renee said ab ab about knowing who we are in Christ. I think people take it too far sometimes. Uh, how can you take it too far, you ask? Well, you say, well, uh, he's, he's my father, so that you know gives me special uh, privileges and, and it can lead to pride and things like that. But knowing who you are, knowing that you're his son or daughter, um, he does want that. He wants a relationship with us. Uh, I think that's made clear. Uh, and then just just knowing that, and uh, there's, there is power in that. According to the working of his mighty power, the end of verse 19, um, there's great power in that. Knowing who you are in him, and then when Satan attacks you, you can even stand on that. I mean, I, I would say it's better to stand on what Christ did, and it's not personal to you, but I think we should know whose we are and know that our Father cares about us and he loves us, and that he's already, Jesus has already won the battle against Satan. He's already, he already has the victory. He's already won. Uh, so remembering that would be uh, helpful as well. Amen. Well, I don't know if I'm uh, defining this correctly or not, but I've said that the difference between teaching and preaching is passion. Mm -hmm. So if we said the same thing that you just said, brother, but you had passion, it would have moved from teaching to preaching. And that's what we see, heard with Sister Renee. She got passionate. There are some things that uh, we don't need to make up our mind in advance that, well, this is, this is something I'm going to really get, raise my voice and be passionate about. No, no. When, when we're talking about something and uh, the, the spirit works on us and moves us to get passionate, uh, it's, uh, that's when we, the passion should come out. Uh, and uh, that this is not trying to uh, criticize uh, Brother Cripps, your, your presentation, because it was didn't have the kind of passion Renee's had. So that's not the point I'm making. It's just I'm showing the contrast in you can say the same thing two different ways, and, and it can be uh, different, uh, different intention or purpose behind it. All right. I don't know if that made any sense. <sighs> All right. Let me go back to the... Uh, Sure. And by the way, yeah. every, but there's a lid for every pot. Some people can't, they can't hear me. Some people I rub the wrong way and they can't get the message from me. Someone with a suave voice like Radio Crips can get through. <laughs> Radio Crips. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, uh, you know, God gives us uh, the gifts and we use them and we uh, it works for some people. And, you know, it just we work together as one body, Brother Luke. And, I, and you're absolutely right. Uh, there's different ways that we present it. But, it, you know. The, the message is the same. God wants us to to know we that He's our Father. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that the thing I'd like to before I get off that subject is that that, that uh, um, 
And if you're moved to be passionate, then it's appropriate. But uh, there are some people though that it's it's part of an act. Uh, they uh, they they're they're performing. We don't want to perform. We want to be led by the spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but I, I want to go back since we always talk about context and the preceding verses, uh, and this is verse eighteen and nineteen. Uh, so what happened before? Uh, I'm not. I'm only going to cover one point because Renee uh, mentioned the earnest. So in verse fourteen it says, which uh, is talking about the uh, of the Holy Spirit uh, being sealed with the Holy Spirit, and it says which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. So uh, we learned earlier that, uh, that uh, God gives us uh, the Holy Spirit as an earnest deposit while we're waiting for the full promise. And the full promise is not only will your spirit be brought to life, but your body will be raised to life everlasting and you'll have a glorified um, perfect triune uh, existence, body, soul, and spirit that's uh, uh, glorified and uh, eternal. That's what we're promised, but God gave us a taste. Remember in Hebrews when it talks about being having tasted? I think that's talking about uh, people who are saved. They've actually tasted it. They got the earnest deposit. And so uh, here, uh, that's, that's what has led up to this point where we are now in verse 18. So I like the way the Amplified amplified these verses here, but what stood out to me was this portion where it talks about the guarantee. Uh, you know, I've made uh, 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 one video titled The Gift and the Guarantee, and I made other videos talking about how I'd like to change our um, thesis or our, our theme rather than being called uh, the grace, uh, the free grace community, uh, because non-believers who haven't ever studied the Bible and you ask them about grace, they will have no idea what we're talking about when we talk about the grace of God. So uh, since they don't know about grace without careful instruction, uh, it's better to use the word gift. Everybody knows what a gift is. If you ask someone to start interrogating what's the definition of a gift, they'll all come to the same conclusion that it's something that someone else gives you that is free, that you're not charged for it. It's, uh, and you don't have to work for it or earn it. So since everybody understands a gift, but not everybody understands grace, I've said, why don't we call ourselves the, 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 uh, the, free, uh, the free gift community, the free gift instead of the free grace. Uh, but so I, I'm wanting, trying to promote the idea of the gospel is about the gift and the guarantee. And here, when we get down to verse 18, when it says, um, so that you will know and cherish the hope that is the divine guarantee, the confident expectation. See, to me, everybody uh, says, well, this is the gospel. And someone else says, well, this is the gospel. Um, more, most commonly, they say the gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3 and 4. And then other people say, well, there's a lot of things not in that one portion of Scripture. What about the deity of Christ? And, and what about imputed righteousness? And, and, and on so many other things. But the, the, the point is that uh, in the... Um, um, the the good news the gospel's good news and if you look at the whole message about why Jesus came what he how he accomplished and what he accomplished for us and his promise to us this is all part of this good news understanding that uh, and it is uh, the good news that our eternal life is guaranteed so that's eternal security that's the blessed assurance but I like the word guarantee because it's modern language that everybody understands what a guarantee is. Uh, if I tell someone that I'm guaranteed I'm going to go to heaven, Jesus guaranteed it to me personally. Uh, they don't; they can understand that kind of language. So I like the way that the uh, Amplified uses it. They call it the divine guarantee, or the confident expectation. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to... Uh... Ed, what you said, you said a lot of people say the gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15, it's 1 through 4. But what is necessary to understand in that? Yes, the entire gospel is there in 1 Corinthians. But what is making it a full package are the words according to the scriptures. Amen. 
So when it says Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was there and rose again on the third day, according to the scriptures. So what is not mentioned is what the according to the scriptures in regards to his resurrection and dying for our sins means. Mm -hmm. so you do have to have more understanding of what was accomplished uh, by the death and what it means that he rose again, because that's the evidence that we're not in our sins. So um, when you put the according to the scriptures there, it encompasses much. Uh, but sadly, you were saying I call ourselves the free gift uh, community. I call ourselves the real Christians because there there are the real believers. Because if you haven't trusted what Jesus did on Calvary gave you eternal life, you're not even a believer. You're not even in the body of Christ. So I don't know what you are. It's like you can think you're following him and trying to live in obedience and get rid of the sin in your life. Which, by the way, I don't need to repent of sin that was already nailed to the cross because my sins were separated as far as the east is from the west when he when uh, uh, he saved me. So, you know, I, I I've just gotten to the point here where the wheat and the tares are real clear and it makes me sad because the tares are revealing themselves coming against the truth of the good news. And that's why I love this section so much that, it, you know, we really are in apostasy. If you look at what is going on just at YouTube, look at the major ministries, Brother Luke, John MacArthur with millions of viewers. Since 1989, he's been propagating this nonsense with his Gospel of Jesus book, which is a bunch of work salvation completely twisted out of context of what Jesus said to Israel while still under the law, trying to make that a condition to receive eternal life. So you'll see how prosperous these ministries are. Uh, and the, the world loves it. You know, so when we see a section like this, Brother Luke, I get on fire because this is what is supposed to encourage us to serve and even suffer for his namesake. Look what he's promised us, not the fear of condemnation. There's no way you can, like Lisa said, you could dangle me over hell with a rusty something and I still wouldn't fall in there. Uh, wouldn't even get burned. Uh, like the fire, Radshack, Meshach, and to get bitten to go to smoke wouldn't even leave a smell on me because there's no way I, I can be lost. And sections like this are so encouraging. Amen. We'll talk about passion. Yeah, another amen, huh? Yeah, we yeah. just got a couple of them coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, I guess we'll move on to the next verse. Um in the KJV, uh, Brother Cripps, you go first on this one. It says, uh, verse 20. Uh, I'll read verse 20 and 21 together. Uh, Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Well, there's another amen right there. Mm -hmm. The name above all names. I mean, Jesus' name, he, he lifts his name up above everything. Uh, and he, and he, he should. He should. Um, so verse 20, which he wrought, it's just a continuation. I mean, we, uh, we, we didn't choose to read the whole uh, passage, but it's a continuing thought from verse 19. So the power that he's talking about, which is wrought in Christ, uh, the above verse working of his mighty power, uh, raised him uh, from the dead and set him at his right hand, in heavenly places. Um, and uh, verse 21, indeed, far above every all principality and power and might and dominion, every name that is named. Uh, yeah, Jesus's name is the name above all names. Uh, and he, he did everything uh, to deserve that. You know, he died for us. I mean, Yes, the, the Father uh, gets all the glory, but Jesus shares does share the glory with, with God. I mean, that that's who should get the glory, not us. We didn't do anything. We don't bring anything to the table. We don't add anything to it. It's all from him. So, of course, uh, I, I, for one, not that it matters what I think, but his name should be high and lifted up above uh, every other name. At least that's uh, Paul's opinion uh, here in this verse. Uh, 
yeah, I guess I'll stop there. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Sister Renee, what do you say? But like you said, uh, Paul's goes on and on here. Hold on. It, it's a continuation. Yeah. I, I like, okay, here's, here's an important uh, word, which he wrought in Christ or he worked in in Christ or is working in Christ. So I'm going to go back to 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ. And that, and our salvation is a work of God. It's something he did, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. You finished at uh, 21, right, Cripps? That's correct. 2021 far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this world but also in that which is to come so he's showing us how christ is elevated above all names but that we are in him and he says that the work he wrought in christ when he raised him from the dead so the work that was done in him is not only did christ rise but we all rose we, that's what our baptism represents, that we died, were buried, and rose again. And we haven't physically risen from the dead yet because flesh and blood doesn't inherit. This body's not going to inherit the kingdom. The new one is. Mm -hmm. But his resurrection, the fact that we are in Christ and the work God did, he wrought it in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And he set him in his own right hand. We're in Christ. We're already seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we rose also. And it's a work of God. That's why I said, if you want to, I'm editing a video together right now, how you can lose salvation. You'd have to do a lot of stuff you can't do to lose it. For one, right here, you'd have to undo the work God did. You'd have to undo the work wrought in Christ at his resurrection. Thank, you. Thank God that's impossible. Amen. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that video. I know I've heard you and others talk about it, the, the things that you'd have to do to undo it. It's a very way, good way of uh, proving the point. Uh, let me uh, read it in the Amplified. Uh, uh, 20 and 21 in the Amplified. It says, uh, uh, which he produced in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, whether angelic or human, and far above every name that is named, above every title that can be conferred. Uh, oops. I not only, uh, I'm sorry, I moved it and the mouse and it went away. Okay. Not only in this age and world, but also in the one to come. Um, well, I think a lot of good points have already been made, but uh, what I'd like to talk about is every name that is named. Uh, you know, we, we all love the scriptures that say that uh, there's a name above all names and every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, uh, I've made this point before, and I'm not sure that I'm, I'm right in, in my feelings or conclusion, but, uh, you know, we're commonly called Christians, and I've changed it to Christian because we don't call him Christ. We call him <laughs> Christ, right? <laughs> yeah. So uh, so I like to say we are Christians, uh, and a Christian is a, a person who relies completely on Christ for their salvation. And that was how I would def define it. But um, the name, the name uh, we, we're supposed to identify with Christ, not Paul, not Cephas, not Apollos, not Luther, not Calvin, not anybody. We're, we're Christ. And uh, he, he's, his name is Jesus Christ. So um, this name Jesus, uh, I believe we need to start using the name Jesus. Train yourself to use the name Jesus because that's the name that causes division. But you, if, you, if you're in a crowd of people and, uh, and uh, somebody uh, generically just mentions God, 
That's all they, they're talking about, something about, and referring to God. Um, they're probably going to get away with it without an uproar, <laughs> you know, because God can mean so many things to so many different people, and, you know, the people will tolerate that. But if, if you dare to say his name, and his name is Jesus, and particularly if you say that you, you make him exclusive, he's the only way, the only real God, the only real Savior, then uh, guess what's going to happen? All hell will break out against you because you identified with his name. Yeah. So I like to train people to um, uh, don't ever use the word God uh, if you can help it, uh, I mean, unless the context is that the sentence requires it. But if, if whenever possible, make sure you're using the name Jesus. It's the name that saves. It's uh, we believe we're saved by believing in his name. The scripture says believing in his name. Well, I think that means believe in what his name means. And his name means literally God saves. So, all right. Uh, anyway. I would, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I would just like to add to that real quick that uh, from, from what I've seen, Christians was the original term that was used and it was derogatory. They would say, oh, you're one of those Christians. That's that's the way, I mean, of course, you know, they, they spoke a different language. That wasn't an American language, obviously. Um, but I believe that's the way it was said. In fact, there was a singer, yeah, he's still alive, I think. His name was Ken Miedema. Uh, some people may know who that is, but he was blind uh, since he was a child, but he, he plays the piano and he writes his own songs. And he has a song in which he said that, and he was going back historically to that period of time uh, during the new church. Uh, and uh, it was a, a song about a guy being witnessed to by one of these Christians. And he said, oh, you're a Christian in the song. The, the other guys call him that, a Christian. So what, when I met up with you, Brother Luke, and you were using that term, it, it was not strange to me. And it's still, uh, uh, it's endearing to me as well, because there are a lot of people, especially in America, that consider themselves Christians. And I, I think it's a smaller group, as uh, Renee mentioned earlier. It's a remnant of people that truly understand the, and, and the gospel. So the term Christian, in many ways, in my opinion, has been hijacked. Uh, and Christian, uh, in, in my opinion, takes it back. It, it, it's like who we identify with. I also agree that uh, saying his name rather than just a generic God term uh, is useful, and we are persecuted for saying the name of Jesus, and that the, the Bible warns us or tells us that we can expect that. Um, it's a lot easier to to say God, I suppose, kind of generically than it is to to name the name of Christ. Yeah, um, the only way they'll say it on TV is as a byword or a curse word or as a yeah. joke to make fun of somebody religious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I saw one uh, show recently that someone uh, used the name in vain, uh, said his name, and then the other person said, is that a good Jesus or a bad Jesus? You know, so the, the term is, is used interchangeably for lots of things, and I've also noticed in Hollywood, it seems like you can't watch a show without his name being used in vain in some way by some character. Yeah, a family uh, guy, they had Jesus Christ walking. Uh, you know, in the actual cartoon, and they said, it doesn't matter, I didn't exist anyway. Right, yeah. Um, They're, yeah. And you, say, you see a, a Big Bang Theory. Oh, they're so brilliant. They're always forced, you know, promoting evolution and stuff. Who's the only Christian on the on the show? It's Sheldon's mother, who's a total lunatic. Yeah, totally. They're just freak. Yeah. Everybody yeah. looks down on because she's so stupid and superstitious and dumb to believe in Jesus and spirit world. Exactly. I, I completely agree, Renee. In fact, they very Hollywood very rarely presents a Christian in the program. It's always to present them as a false prophet who's really a pedophile or uh, embezzles money or is really a hypocrite or if there's never like a true Christian. Uh, yeah. If somebody is, is like good and decent, they always have them being a new ager or a Hindu like Gandhi. Uh, yeah. They'll never show a, a true Christian. They'll, it, it, Christianity is to be mocked and con considered um, like even on the radio today, it said, uh, I, I, we'll talk about that book that uh, a long time ago people went crazy over talking about the Bible. We are not crazy over it. It's inspired word of God. 
-hmm. I am crazy for it, but we're not crazy because we believe that Bible is true. But it's like every chance they get, they jab. They do that. It's either by belittling or mocking or making someone that is a believer into some kind of enemy and dislikable. They never have somebody just be a little person that's a really loving, good Christian that lives their faith. They never do that. Never. Crazy. I, I, I think your criticism is justified. Um, I'll, I'll also say that um, some of the criticism um, it, against um, Christendom um, it, it is deserved. Uh, I, I've made some videos that uh, I'm surprised some people didn't come after me because I've, I've said that the the uh, the um, these are the uh, top five reasons people reject Christianity. Uh, uh, the, the five reasons Christians make me sick. I mean, I know it's 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 a uh, what do you call it? Provocative, the way I, I presented that. But the, the, the truth is that there are many professing Christians. Now, we who, who knows if they are Christian or not, but they, they call themselves Christians. So the world thinks of them as some kind of a Christian. And yet they're, they're, they're bigots. They're, they're, they're racist. They're narrow minded. They're, they're hateful. They're, they're judgmental. All the stereotypes that we don't want to, to be associated with that we don't feel are really are justified about us. I, I the people that, that I, I know and love and work with, I don't think that applies to us. And yet many others, I've worked with a lot of street preachers that gosh, the, the hatefulness coming out of their mouths as they're preaching is uh, makes the, the audience will say to me, well, if that's what a Christian is, I never want to be one. Yep. Um, so, so some of the criticism is, is deserved. Uh, but um, uh, there are some many Christians, though, that I think um, we could cite and say, well, what about him? Just like God said to say, well, what about Job? OK, and, and uh, uh, I could say that, uh, well, none of us are that famous, um, but uh, except for Sister Renee, maybe maybe Renee is famous enough to mention like this. But I would say, what about Ravi Zacharias? I mean, everybody understands this man is a highly intelligent, intellectual, respected scholar, theologian, an apologist, and and uh, as kind-hearted and gentle and and uh, considerate as anybody that uh, any to represent uh, Christianity. Come on, uh, he would never em em embarrass us and, and cause anybody to think of us as Christianity in a bad light. You've got Malcolm Smith. Uh, John Lennox. There are many who are uh, great theologians, uh, truly Christians, and, and they are a real ambassadors for Christ that are not making people think that Christians are crazy, you know, big bigots. Amen. All right. Uh, shall we go on to another verse? Yeah, that was good. Okay, let's do it. Um, verse 22 and 23, I'll read them together, Renee. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, yeah. which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Mm. Yeah, this is an, another confirmation, man. If we break this down, let me look. And has put all things under his feet. God's put all things under the feet of Jesus, by the way, and we're in him. He is the head and we are the body. We are in, you cannot be outside his body once you've been born into his body. It's just not possible. Nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ. We are complete in Christ. Uh, our behavior doesn't determine our position. It can determine fellowship and reward, even chastisement and even possible early death. But it will never determine our position or our destination. He has put all things under his feet, under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, mm -hmm. which is his body. The church is his body and we are, we are his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. And again, we're complete in him, all in all. Christ is in all of us. And so, uh, 
this section of Ephesians, I did a video last week on the section right after, you know, I get inspired to do that after a video, uh, Luke, sometimes on a section of scripture we already studied. And I was telling them about the security deposit, the earnest of our inheritance. Uh, you know, you can't get clearer than that. Here's a security deposit. The rest will be paid later. You, you can't lose that. It's yours forever. So uh, to me here, it's just, it's showing us that all the work was done by God in Christ. And we receive it by faith because we're in Christ by faith. Again, most people claiming professing Christendom, they're not in Christ because they never trusted in Christ. They never believed the message or the report, the record God gave of his son. He gives us eternal life. That life's in his son. He gave it to us. He paid for it. The works were wrought in Christ by God for us. Mm -hmm. He wanted us to be his children. He reconciled the world to himself. That he did it. He saw sin as something that had destroyed us, that we were victims of. And he took care of it. So all these people trying to do sin management for their salvation. I, I told Brother Dave, I got somebody, that Kenny Marker guy that wouldn't leave me alone. I blocked him on Facebook, but sometimes people post something of mine and he loses his mind. Renee still says sin won't bring death. No, we admit the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. That's what they hate. They hate the message of, of God's grace like that. It drives them nuts for years now. Every time he sees me, he can't stand that message. You're telling me that's not spiritual? Somebody that hates it that much, that is a spiritual force that's bringing hatred against the message of the gospel like that. So this section of Ephesians to me, it, it, it shows how we're one in Christ. Not only are we in Christ and one with him, we're in Christ and one with another. We are all all members of the same body. Amen. Yes, amen to that. She's getting a lot of amens tonight, isn't she? She is. Yeah. All right, Brother Cripps, I'm going to read 22 and 23 in the Amplified. It says, uh, And he put all things in every realm in subjection under Christ's feet and appointed him as supreme and authoritative head over all things in the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills and completes all things in all believers. Wow. Amen. Um, I mean, Renee did a pretty good job of explaining it, but uh, I would just have to say uh, that, he is all in all. Um, someone asked, maybe someone answered him. I didn't see that, but Hendricks asked in the chat, what does it mean to be head over all things to the church? Um, I think it means exactly what it means. I love that Paul uses here all in all. Um, that pretty much covers, I've said before, what does all, what does all uh, mean? All means all. That's all all means. I mean, it means everything. Um, and, uh, uh, people that believe that God is going to reconcile all things, even the uh, unsaved and I've mentioned it before um, the lake of fires are crucible and stuff. This is one of those verses that they uh, use to, to pretty much any verse that says all in all or anything like that. Uh, they, they kind of use that. Um, uh, Brother Luke, I'm, I'm I know what you mean. I've heard that. I've heard yeah. people use that for universalism. You're, that's thank you, Renee. I was I, I couldn't think of the name of it, um, but I've mentioned before. I've got a friend who believes in that, and uh, talk about someone that uh, that uh, regurgitates the right gospel and all that. Um, uh, I, I haven't seen anything in this individual other than the fact that he is universalist that would lead me to think that he was false or anything like that. Now I I, I don't know a lot of people that believe this. Um, but he says all the right stuff. So other th other than being a universal uh, universalist, is that what they call him? Yeah, there are people very cleverly twisting scripture, and right. they're and I believe saved people can't fall for it. But they're, what they're doing there is saying, well, if all aren't saved, then you're calling Jesus a failure. 
Right. You know, and they're using that angle. And then instead of seeing this in context, when it's talking about all in the body of Christ, mm. Christ is all and in all. It says he is the head of the body. You exactly. have to be part of the body. But exactly. Clever, and I know what you're talking about, Crips. I've heard that used for this. Support. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. Yeah. So verse 22, though, I think the, the point that I get from these uh, two verses, other than the one that, that we just covered, is that uh, he, God has put everything under his feet. Now, um, for us, we haven't seen all that happen. Like people say, well, the kingdom of God is in hand and they misunderstand what that means. Right now, I don't see uh, Jesus ruling from uh, from Jerusalem, from New Jerusalem. There, there are things that need to happen yet before uh, we can see the fruit of put all things under his feet. But he has already won the victory. We just haven't seen all that uh, take place within time yet, but we will. Um, I, I, I believe all the promises in scripture and I, I believe this one and hath put all things under his feet. Just haven't seen all the ramifications of that yet. Uh, Jesus already is all in all. He already is the head of the church. Um, it's like, uh, we're talking about the earnest, the, the promise being sealed and having the promise of eternal bodies. I believe that just as much as I believe anything else. I, I know that I will eventually get my eternal body. And I believe that the uh, confirmation uh, from the Holy Spirit, having the Holy Spirit in me, uh, is is uh, is why I believe it. I trust it, and, and it's more than just a, I hope so. I know that it's going to happen, and that's that's from Him. That's not because I'm some great thinker, or I've you know parceled it all out and figured it out intellectually. No, uh, uh, Satan is very very good at twisting our intellect and. And he 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 does it in any way he can, regardless of of what uh, denomination we belong to or or any of that. So anyway, uh, he has put all things under his feet, and Jesus is all that we need. Uh, we don't need anything else. He is all in all for the body of Christ. So uh, focusing in on him and his word, he is also his word, which is wonderful and amazing. Uh, he's all, uh, Jesus is all we need. All our focus should be on him and not ourselves and not the world and not pastors or anything else should, should be all about Jesus. All right. Uh, do you think that, uh, Hendrix's, uh, question was uh, answered yet? If, if not, uh, let's give a little more, but let, let me, me look. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Know. I'll look. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I just want to talk about this term all in all. Uh, the, I think the first time I heard that where I, it really stood out to me was when we uh, studied uh, Spurgeon's sermon, uh, Warrant of Faith. Um, he used the term all in all. And uh, I always loved that term. And, and, but, but what does all in all mean? Uh, it, it just means, I, to me, it means he's my everything. Uh, that I, I would not. I would not exist without him. Yeah. I would not have aired without him. My heart would not beat without him. Uh, I would not have any purpose. I there. It would. He is my all. In all. Amen. Praise God, Luke. So um, I. I also like the uh, very often after we have one of our uh, group discussions, whether it's Sunday, Wednesday. Or Friday, I, Renee, you routinely have something that comes up where you decide you want to do a follow-up video. And if you're not paying attention out there, make sure you, you uh, look out for those uh, because she usually takes something that got her interest and will do a 10 or 20-minute video on it. And I'm expecting uh, something from her tonight. I don't know what she's going to talk about, but uh, uh, I'd love to hear you uh, teach on that term all in all yeah. but, uh, it is a beautiful concept to me that uh, he is my everything Amen. Uh, Good point. Right. so we're ready to go to, to uh, the next chapter and it, it doesn't mean that the subject's changing remember the mm -hmm. chapters were not numbered and, and uh, designated uh, until um, uh, about a thousand years ago and then the verse numbers were not assigned until about 600 years ago. So um, uh, these, these are not 
part of scripture actually they were not part of the original uh, manuscripts there were no chapters and verse numbers uh, so that is just because we're moving on to chapter two verse one now doesn't mean i i don't know what the first verse is uh two verse one says right now until we look but uh it could mean that we're moving to a different subject, but it could very well be a continuation of the very last point that was made. So let, let's find out. <laughs> we're going to find out really quick, Brother Luke. Yeah. Okay, so off to uh, chapter 2, verse 1 in the KGV, and oh, well, that should be an indication. <laughs> That's all we need. Yeah. Uh, he's continuing the thought by saying, and so uh, let, you don't, don't don't start in chapter two and think that this thought began here. You'd have to go back to get the context of what he means when he says, and. So it says, uh, I'm going to read uh, uh, one and two together. Uh, and you who, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins wherein in times past ye walked according. Now, I decided after reading verse one that I'm going to stop there because that one point alone in, is such a uh, major verb. Well, it's a verse, but there's a semicolon after it, so it is connected to the, the following uh, uh, verse. Uh, however, just verse one by itself, a lot re relies on us understanding this one verse. So let's let's go with that. I think it's Crips is your turn, isn't it? Uh, I I don't know, but I'm I'm happy to go. Okay, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I would agree with you. I mean, you could have broken it up. Uh, I mean, you could have read it together, but this this is a huge verse for people to understand. I would completely agree. Um, and we've talked about this before. I love it that I get to say this again. You know, we talk about uh, us being dead. We're we're like zombies. Uh, and the reason I, I choose that, because I think that's a pretty good depiction of who we are without Christ. Uh, even though you can't see it, you, you can't look at a person now and see their dead spirit inside. I mean, you can see indications of it. If you're around them enough, you can see that they don't have a confession, that they don't know the gospel. I mean, there's lots of different ways you can see it. But uh, Paul says, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Um, this is the, what the work of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that quickens our spirit. We don't have the power to raise ourselves up from any kind of death. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The minute you believe, the minute you believe, he, he does that work in you. It's his work. It's not anything we do ourselves. We uh, Again, we don't have the power to do it. Earlier I said we don't bring anything to the table, and that's absolutely true. God gets the credit. Jesus gets the credit. The Holy Spirit gets the credit for everything that has to do with salvation. Uh, uh, and he, he will not share his glory with another. They get all the glory and we get none of it. And that's okay with me. I don't want anything I do to be countered in the balance. And unfortunately, if you don't accept the gift of salvation, that's the way he's going to judge you, judge you by your own works. You're basically saying, I'm going to, uh, okay, Christ did everything. Uh, I, I don't have to do anything, but I would rather have my, whatever weight is in the balance of the things that I've done in my life, I would rather have that matter more. And to me, that's just plain foolishness. If God's offering you a gift and he's done everything already and all you have to do is truly believe it, and that means many things. It means that you'll have a relationship with God forever. It means you'll have an eternal body, which is the the earnest promise that we're given once we're sealed with Holy Spirit. The moment that our spirit is alive, that's when the seal is put, I believe. that That's when the seal is on you and it can never be broken. A, a seal that God puts cannot be broken by anybody. It's the same thing as the, the door on the ark, I believe, is a shadow of that. He, uh, God, when God closed the door, no man can open it. So it's the same thing with us. Nothing separates us from the love of God, nothing. So once you're saved, you're always saved. He quickens us, and we were dead in trespass and sin. We were dead. This is clear. Uh, and now we're alive through Christ. That's what makes us alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, oh, I thought it was muted there. Okay. Thank you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Renee, what do you say about uh, 2 verse 1? Yeah, I, I love this because this is a past tense. This is talking about our birth. 
you you are born into God's family because you were dead. And he brought that dead spirit to life when he connected you to the source of life, the spirit of Christ. And we were baptized into Christ. We were dead, but we're now alive. So in order to lose it again, you'd have to kill the spirit that God brought to life. Uh, and this is showing this is an irreversible thing. This is our permanent positional state now. We've been born in God's family. Uh, I was born into my dad's family. No matter what I do, I'm still his daughter. Uh, when I'm obedient, he's pleased. When I'm disobedient, he's worried and tries to correct it. So same with our heavenly father. So uh, uh, it's, just, it's just ignorance for people to say otherwise. But this is a continuing thought. He's mentioning the body. How Christ is ahead in, in the body. And I love how uh, Luke was saying all in all, he even got choked up because he's so, so overwhelmed by how Christ Jesus is his everything. You know, and that's another thing. The ridiculous accusations that come from these people to the true brethren. You know, we love the Lord. How dare them think that they love the Lord and we don't because we love sin just because we trusted Christ. But we are standing in God's promise. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. So here it's saying, you know, Jesus is the head of the church, which is his body. And the continuing thought is, and you, has he quickened? And you've heard the expression, the quick and the dead. It means uh, the living and the dead. And so you, as he quickened, he's brought to life who were dead in trespasses and sins. So we, we were dead uh, in trespasses and sins. But it says that he condemned sin in the flesh. This flesh is dead. We're to reckon it already dead. And he condemned sin in the flesh of Christ. So there is no, to me, it doesn't even make sense. There's no sin to repent of. We were dead in trespasses and sins. That's gone. Now we're alive. We should be walking in newness of life. Why are we looking backwards trying to clean that up instead of living with our eyes on Christ? Here it tells us clearly we were dead in trespasses and sins, but he has quickened us which implies you're no longer dead in those trespasses and sins. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I said the way that you ended there, I was waiting for, for more. I mis misunderstood your in voice inflection that time. <laughs> okay. Um, let me see. Uh, uh, did you both comment on that? Yes, Renee, you started Crips. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the reasons that this verse is so important uh, is because uh, uh, Calvinism, for one, and um, what uh, I guess we could say Pelagianism is another that will take this verse and if there's a problem the way they, they understand it. Uh, First, I'll talk about the Calvinist problem. Um, the Calvinists believe that uh, when this verse says that, uh, um, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, um, that they're saying that when it says you are dead, they extrapolate that the meaning of that is that uh, you are not capable of doing anything. The first, um, point of tulip, the T is total inability. Now, total depravity is one thing. Uh, in Calvinism, originally the term total depravity was the way that they would express it. And that just means that everybody's born with a sin nature and it's inevitable that we'll all sin. Uh, um, but uh, total inability is more of the modern version of this Calvinist idea. And that is the teaching that um, we do not innately have the ability to understand and believe the gospel uh, because we're dead. And they like to say, a dead man can't do anything. 
So they come to the conclusion and teach the exact opposite of what the Bible says. Because last Wednesday, we showed a verse that shows you the sequence of the events. We hear the gospel, we believe, we receive the Holy Spirit, and we get quickened and regenerated. But the Calvinists say, no, you're not able to believe it because you're dead. A dead man cannot believe. So they believe that you have to be brought to life first before you're able to believe. And so they say, based on this verse here, that we were dead in trespasses and sins, and God quickened us. And then once you're quickened, now you're able to become a believer. So basically, quickened means that you're brought to life. And what, what's brought to life? Well, your, your body's already alive. It didn't need to be quickened. Your mind or your soul is already functioning, and it didn't need to be quickened. It was a dead spirit. And I, I do believe that we can conclude from this verse that what happened in the garden was an actual death on the day of the violation. God said, the day that you eat of that, you will die, that very day. And yet, there's a record that they lived 800 years or so more. So is the Bible wrong? No, because it says that in the, that same chapter, it says that man is triune, like God in God's image. We are three in one. I am one Luke, and yet I'm Luke body, Luke soul, Luke spirit. Amen. The problem is that, uh, that when we're born uh, from a mother's womb, we're born as an incomplete person. We're only two-thirds of a person. So, uh, Sister Paula uh, made a really good observation that, that if you put it in, into a numerical, uh, into a decimal point value rather than fractional, what does two-thirds equal in the decimal? It is 0.666, right? That's, so we are born as... 0.666 of a person, two-thirds of a person, a functioning body, a functioning soul, but a non-functioning, non-living spirit wow. that needs to be brought to life. Wow. So I do think that this is one of the important verses in the Bible, uh, and yet the Calvinists take it, and then they, they uh, go too far with it and say that because you're dead spiritually, that you're incapable of be, uh, believing unless God brings your spirit to life first. Uh, so that's where the mistakes are. Now in Pelagianism, the, way, the reason that they take this wrong is that they're saying that uh, uh, you, you are not uh, dead spiritually as far as the, there was not a death of the spirit at the garden, that, that, that they don't believe in the, the fall and that uh, there was a death. That, and they don't believe that we have a sin nature. They believe that a man is born perfectly capable of being sinless. There's uh, still preaching that mess, Brother Luke. Still mm -hmm. preaching it, trying to deny the inherited Adam, uh, that we inherited sin from Adam. And I mean, it's crazy what they're out there preaching. I had to do a video against it because it was getting so popular. You know, I took mm -hmm. clips of the guy saying it. It's, it's mm -hmm. really getting popular. Mm -hmm. So, what they think that God's grace is is not that God is gracious enough to offer us eternal life as a free gift, but, but God is gracious so that, so that uh, we, we don't have a sin nature, therefore we are able to live a sinless life, and, and through uh, the Holy Spirit helping us, the God is gracious enough so that he will help us so we can stop sinning, become perfect, and then go before God, and based on our own righteousness, uh, we, we qualify for uh, heaven. That's Pelagianism. Mm -hmm. uh, so this verse is important for a, a lot of reasons. Um, uh, all right, I guess I, I probably went on too long there, but uh, no, no, no. I, I, before we move forward, though, I, this is the perfect opportunity for me to point out, Brother Luke, because there was a broadcast. I don't remember which night it was. Maybe it was a Friday night uh, where I uh, uh, asked you directly, or, or forget how it all came out, but I said, "Do you uh, do you see like I see that?" Uh, Calvinists do have some truth. My problem with them is they take it too far. So there is some truth from this verse about us being dead in trespasses and needing to be quickened. Um, but you you said it best. Uh, they take it too far. They take it, something that is true, and they they take it with their intellect. And Satan uh, 
uses their own intellect to twist them into the point of taking it way past the point in which which there is truth. So just just so you understand, that's what I meant by saying that the, the Calvinists have some truth. They do, but they just take it too far. They, they rather than just looking to the word and allowing the Holy Spirit to explain to them what that means, they use their own intellect to try to to try to parcel out uh, an understanding, which is always detrimental, in my opinion. The best lies, the most effective lies have truth in them. Yeah. You know, he, he's good at that. He he knows scripture and twist it. Uh, and tomorrow's uh, Thursday's theological throwdown is actually called Calvinism. So close, but oh, so far. Awesome. So it's so close awesome. to the truth, but it's so far from the truth yeah. because yeah. it's so close to the truth. Yep, exactly. Well, I can't wait for that. There's a little bit of passion for you, Brother Luke. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. You're muted, though. We'll hear no passion from you with your with you muted. <laughs> you missed all my passion. Yeah. Uh, I'm tempted to see if we could veer for a moment um, because uh, Cripps used, used a, an expression that uh, I just, just a few, over the last few days, I've come to have to rethink something. And, and we, you know, you've heard me say this many times, and I do believe that in the Reformation, there's a principle called the five solas. Mm -hmm. uh, S O L A S, sola means only in Latin. Yep. And uh, the five onlys. Uh, and there's uh, sola uh, gratia, uh, sola mm -hmm. uh, gl uh, gloria de Dios, uh, so sola fide, sola Cristo and uh, sola scriptura. Uh, and I do believe in all these, these solas, but the idea of uh, sola gloria de Dios, uh, only glory for God. Um, and so we, uh, we know that uh, if, when it comes to the gospel, uh, if we um, are contributing to the salvation by doing some kind of religious work, then uh, we know that that's um, not God's way because uh, uh, God uh, do, has done everything. All we need to do is receive the gift. And see, if Crips, if you were to give me a very wonderful gift, and let's say you worked real hard and saved your money, and you know, blood, sweat, tears went into it, and boy, and you you bought it, and then you gave it to me, uh, and then I received the gift. I cannot get any glory because I accepted the gift. Right. You still get all the glory and everything you did to get to, to provide it for me. So the idea that we, we believe and we receive the gift doesn't take any glory from God. But if we say that uh, I earned it because of the good or righteous things I've done, right. uh, then we're going to say that, no, Christ doesn't get all the glory because he didn't do enough. I had to help him with it. Yep. That's where they, they go wrong with this. So I do believe in sola gloria, uh, de, de, uh, sola gloria de Dios. However, I was listening to uh, Leighton Flowers, who is one of the very best authorities on Calvinism. He's a former Calvinist. And uh, anybody interested in Calvinism, that's the first place I would send you. It's a soter Soteriology 101. Agreed. Uh, but he... Uh, uh, he brought up a verse that just slipped my mind. Uh, I, I maybe uh, maybe it's because I had only read it in the KJV. Uh, but uh, here's a verse for everybody to consider and, and then study this. And, and then let's get back and talk about this more. But uh, let's go to 2 Thessalonians 2.14. Um, now, it says in the KJV, it says, Whereunto... He called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so it says to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, what does that mean to obtain the glory? Does that mean that we obtain glory? Uh, if we look at it in other translations, verse 14 in the Amplified says, it was to this end that he called you through our gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, 
so that you may obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And other translations include this idea of sharing the glory. And that, yeah, we know that there's other places in the Bible that says God doesn't share his glory. So um, I've, I've come to the conclusion, I think, that uh, uh, God doesn't share his glory in terms of, uh, hey, uh, your salvation is, uh, I'm going to do everything that's needed. Don't try to uh, justify your salvation through, uh, except just relying on me. And that way he says, no, don't try to take any glory. But uh, isn't it true that God shares his glory by giving us imputed righteousness? Righteousness is, I would call it, the glory of God. Only God is righteous. We don't have any righteousness. But God shares his righteousness, imputes it, covers us with his righteousness. And so uh, I believe that's an example of God sharing his glory with us by imputing his righteousness. But in verse 14, if we interpret it the way most translations do, it says, it was to this end that he called you through the gospel, the good news of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, so that you may obtain and share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we do get to share in the glory of God. God does share his glory, but only in the respect that he imputes his righteousness and in that way, uh, not, not in that you deserve some credit for, for earning your salvation. Yeah, that makes sense. Share share the glory, but not the credit. Yeah. So um, so that's why when I hear everybody using the term, as I've used it my whole life too, is that uh, no, uh, uh, all the glory for God. God doesn't share His glory. Well, I think we need to understand that the Bible does say God doesn't share His glory, and the Bible does say God does share His glory. So we need to understand the, wh what it means by those those two. Uh, 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 seem seemingly uh, opposing uh, ideas. All right, anybody want to comment on that? I know I took us off track a bit, but since you brought up this uh, uh, not sharing his glory, Crips, I thought I'd, I'd mention that. Yeah, no problem. Anybody want to say more or should we go on? Go on. Okay, let's go to uh, uh, back to uh, Ephesians uh, verse 2 in chapter 2. Um Wherein, in time past, ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. I think it's Sister Renee's turn, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead, Renee, verse 2. Yeah, and also this is another statement of fact. So... Uh, wherein, okay, where, wherein what? When we were dead. We were dead in trespasses and sin, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. I, I love that uh, verse because a lot of people think Satan is in hell or the king of the underworld. No, he's in the second heaven. All the, You see that stuff, all those weird bulbs of light and stuff? I think that's all spiritual wickedness in high places. I seriously do. And, you know, the ancients knew that was spiritual stuff, too. They believed they were angelic Merkabas uh, or um, angelic um, uh, chariots, they called them back then. So I like this verse, Prince of the Power of the Air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And by the way, children of disobedience are never a term used for saints. You'll never see where God calls his children, children of disobedience. Amen. Children of disobedience are those who have not obeyed the gospel. Yes. They don't believe the gospel. They're unbelievers. Children of disobedience are those who haven't believed the gospel. That's why I get so concerned for these people that profess Christ. Because technically, they're still children of disobedience. No yeah. matter how hard they're trying to obey commandments or make jesus the lord of their life they have not obeyed the gospel they mm -hmm. haven't believed what god said about his son yeah uh and it starts there uh so god will never refer to us as children of disobedience As a matter of fact he's saying that's not who you are a lot of times paul is confirming our identity in christ confirming the promises of our inheritance confirming 
our positional standing. And so where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. If you're Christ, and it says here earlier in Ephesians, you were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. We see everywhere, including Romans. If you live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. We are not to walk according to the spirit that works in the children of disobedience. We walk according to the spirit of Christ in us. So when he says children of disobedience, it's unbelievers. But you're not Amen. anymore. Amen. All right. Thank you. Um, all right, Brother Cripps, let me read uh, uh, verse 2 in the Amplified. Uh, in which you once walked, you were following the ways of this world, that is, you were influenced by this present age, mm -hmm. in accordance with the prince of the power of the air, that is Satan, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, that is the unbelieving who who fight against the purposes of God. Wow, it, it uh, Renee did a good job of explaining it. Apparently the amplified backs are up. These these are the unsaved uh, folks. We're, Paul here uh, in this verse is not talking about uh, the saved believers. He's talking about the unsaved. Well, he's talking about saved believers when he says uh, about we were dead in trespasses, past tense, where in time past ye walked, walked is past tense. And it it uh, it explains that more uh, in the Amplified by saying we're following the ways of this world, influenced by the present age. Um, that's not us. Uh, we're not once once we're believers. Once our that spirit in us, that dead spirit, is quickened, we no longer belong to the world. We're not slaves to sin. We're slaves to righteousness. Uh, Renee also, uh, I, I wish I remembered how she phrased it, but she's basically talking about people that are, are sin focused. I thought it was so good uh, the way you phrased that, Renee. Um, but this is this is what these people's minds are constantly occupied by. It's, it, it's like they're uh, because they're not resting in Christ's finished work. They're looking at others, uh, not as much themselves. But what that means is that they're not at rest in themselves over their own sin. So they're going to focus on everyone else's. They're still dead in trespasses and sins. Why would a person that has been forgiven and know that they're forgiven of all sins and trespasses be con be so constantly focused on it? Um, when you have the Holy Spirit, I, you know, I, I'm the first one to say, yes, we still have the flesh. We still have to make a decision. Uh, daily to uh, either walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh, but the Holy Spirit helps us do that. So we don't have to be preoccupied with that. Um, I also like the characterization, and I agree completely, Renee, uh, that the, the ancients knew uh, some of these powers, some of these things that we see in the air. Um, uh, uh, Jen and I were talking earlier about meteorites because uh, with our uh, worldview of creation and there being a dome and all that, uh, that's one of the questions people ask all the time. What about meteorites? Uh, and um, uh, we looked up uh, uh, answers from Genesis. And, of course, they don't believe any of that. And uh, they say falsely that we look at uh, that, quote, unquote, flat earthers look at Scripture and we just we just misinterpret it. Um, we don't we don't even know what the what the meteorites actually are. Uh, some of the things that that like falling stars, we don't know what they are, uh, but they did believe that uh, in ancient times they believed it was a spiritual. And I I agree. The power of the air, he he's the prince of the power of the air. He controls uh, a lot of these things. Um, the but the I guess the biggest point from this, uh, Renee, I already made. But I was going to say you could uh, interpose uh, workers of iniquity in that children of disobedience slash workers of iniquity. I believe. Ooh important because you know old testament confirmed workers of iniquity and right. people try to use that against believers and it's not talking about us it's talking about enemies of god right exactly exactly right that's okay. all all right thank you very much uh well let me see there's um a footnote i'll look at uh for verse uh let me see, where is it? Verse 2. It says, The age of this world, or 
Aeon. That's A-E-O-N. That's a term found in Gnostic thought, possibly synonymous with the rulers of this world, but also reflecting the Jewish idea of two ages, this present evil age and the age to come. Uh, then it talks about the disobedient, meaning literally the sons of disobedience, a Semitism, as in Isaiah 30, verse 9. I don't know what this is. For this is a rebellious people, deceitful children, children who refuse to listen. Um, uh, all right, so that's that's the footnote. Uh, so there's really nothing else. Uh, um, I think that... Uh, I don't have anything else to add on verse two, but uh, uh, well, I'll tell you what stands out to me right now, though. Uh, it's 756. That's uh, 1056 uh, in the east. And yes. we, we try to stop at 11. And when I saw that, I was flabbergasted. Yeah, tonight went, went by very quickly. Really? I mean, it, it's been going by faster and faster. But this one, this one takes the cake. Uh, yeah, it seemed like uh, it seemed like we should be halfway through at most. Right, and it's been ninety minutes, so I'm just amazed by that. But uh, same uh, same thing happened to me five minutes ago, brother Luke. So yeah. Oh, you recognize that five? I minutes. did. I wow. did. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's uh, ending with uh, verse two of chapter two. So Ben, make a note of that. We'll begin with chap with verse three, chapter two next time. So let's take our time now to begin our summaries. Uh, first, let's get Ben's thoughts. Uh, ben, you haven't uh, interrupted. Uh, usually I wait for you to get, get to feel like, hey, I need to say something about this, and I rely on you to impose that, but uh, you didn't have anything to say. So give us your thoughts on the whole uh, study tonight. Uh, well, I enjoyed it. I think it was very empowering and uplifting, um, very edifying. Um, and I, I love, Brene, your, the, the emphasis you put on on the victory and the power that we have, and, and it's already done. We're already seated in heaven, uh, heavenly places. We're in Christ. He's already risen. Um, and uh, again, I think it's, it's something we all need to hear over and over again. It's important that we preach the gospel to ourselves. Um, and uh, yes, there wasn't really any particular puzzling passages. Uh, that's sometimes what I'd like to zero in on and maybe offer some insights here or there, but you guys were spot on all the way and a very uplifting study. And it's, I think it's just going to get better from here. Awesome. Ben, did you have any amens that, that we didn't hear? Amen, 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 all night long. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, let's uh, go with uh, uh, Brother Cripps next. What's your summary thoughts? Yeah, this is this is a great study. And uh, like Brother Luke said, I, I looked up the clock and realized it, it was so so close to the uh, quitting time. And I, I'm, frankly, I'm disappointed. <laughs> I, 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 this is one of those times when you get a uh, Holy Spirit gets going uh, and, and I, I feel like he speaks uh, through us that uh, I could take it longer. You know, I can, I can go to 1130 Eastern time uh, if we wanted to, um, but we'll save it for next week. Uh, so uh, some of the biggest things from tonight, um, going back to verse 18 from the previous chapter, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened and, uh, uh, as Renee did, like like uh, Ben mentioned, did a very good job of explaining the inheritance and the saints and and, and all of that. That was very good. Um, also, uh, Paul making the point that uh, that Jesus' name is above every name, every name that is named, and uh, we need to keep that in the in the proper uh, context and know that everything was put under his feet. Uh, and then uh, verse 23, which his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Jesus is sufficient. We don't need a uh, brick and mortar. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to one. So please hear me on that. But uh, Jesus is everything you need. If you want to uh, uh, have a relationship with him, you have everything. You have his word and you have a relationship with him. Um, you don't need anything else. You don't need anything from the world at all. You can, you can, uh, you, you can be confident uh, in, in uh, his word and his promises and his, uh, the relationship that you have with him, um, not based on feelings, not based on feelings, but reading his word and the Holy Spirit speaking to you. And then uh, we only got through two verses in chapter two, uh, but even in those ones, uh, in verse one, 
uh, we went over uh, quickened and we were dead in trespasses. And the biggest point from chapter two is realizing that we are not children of disobedience. We are not workers of iniquity. If you accept the gift of salvation and you believe it, you are no longer uh, you you no longer share that identity with uh, dead spirits in the world. Your spirit is made alive, and nothing can ever uh, change that. God will uh, give you the the uh, uh, we have the earnest as we discussed. We have the promise of an eternal body and uh, spending eternity with Him, and He will fulfill it. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to to stress over it. Um, we believe it and we accept his promises. And once that happens, nobody can uh, sway your doctrine or, or get you off, off, off that uh, understanding. Holy Spirit will uh, confirm that in you. Um, and that, that what a great gift it all is. And uh, Jesus gets all the glory for that. So thank you. Praise God. Oh, good night to everyone in the chat, too. Uh, you guys are awesome, as usual. Yeah. All right, brother, I say amen. Thank you. Uh, all right, uh, Sister Renee, uh, I'd like to hear a summary, but also could you give us an uh, intro to your uh, talk tomorrow night? Yes, sir. Um, man, I, I like you said, I usually do a short video after. This whole section gets me fired up. It's a continuation of the promise and like jason was saying god wants us to know he wants us to know we're his and what we have to look forward to and so the uh, holy spirit uh, of promise is the, the security deposit for the inheritance and we're supposed to keep our eyes on christ and and what's ours and how we're already there these uh, spiritual concepts people can't see them you know it says Seeing, they, they won't see, and hearing, they won't hear. Mm -hmm. the, the whole concept, they, they can only see sin and God's wrath, and they, they somehow think their own righteousness is helping. Yeah. And people think that, that they'll never get it. I mean, until they understand it's impossible, and it's only through Christ. I mean, he's the only reason, because we're in him, that we get to enter heaven. It's God's heart. That he wants a large family. He wants children. That's why he created us. But the, the fall happened. And so he had to fix that. And God did fix it. And it didn't have anything to do with man. Man didn't have anything at all. We were helpless. No. He rescued us uh, through his son. And so uh, it's just so sad when people don't get it. But I, I love this section of Ephesians. Um, because I want to read this one part down here to remind us, you know, uh, last week it said, in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, will work with all things after the counter of his will. And by the way, it's saying that those that are in Christ are predestinated to this inheritance, not yep. that you were predestinated to be in Christ. Right. Uh, so, and he wants us to have the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. Why? That you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. He wants us to have our eyes open, to have the understanding of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, most of these preachers don't. They want you in fear. But John says perfect. Uh, anybody who fears has not been made perfect in love. Perfect love casts out fear. Fear has torment. Yes. Of God, not for his people. Mm. And I'm, I'm really loving this study. And we're still on chapter one, man. But I love it. And lately I've been noticing that just the salutations of Paul's letters are filled with powerful messages. Yeah. Now, uh, Tomorrow night on Thursday's Theological Throwdown on the live stream on my channel at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we will be discussing Calvinism. Uh, Calvinism, so close, but oh so far. Because it's close because it has pieces of truth, but so far from the truth because that truth is twisted. 
Amen. And it defiles the character and nature of God. It makes another gospel. It destroys the message of God reconciling the world to himself. Uh, and so, uh, you know, God would have to be a liar when he said God, for God to love the world. And that whosoever will come and take of the water of life freely. Um, that he desires that none should perish, but all come to repentance. And Jesus said he would draw all men to himself. So you got to make all not be all. You got to make the world be only the elect special people and mm. make God a liar. So we're going to talk about that. Yeah. You know, they take the truth of man being totally depraved to the extent that can't, man can't be incapable of believing something. <laughs> and that's ridiculous. I, I, I mean, there's truth of our depravity. Yeah. But there's nowhere that says God uh, <laughs> that man can't even believe something. Right. You know, that. And the Calvinists have it backwards. They say God has to regenerate us first. So right. we can believe. there well, you go. The Bible says we are born again or regenerated because we believe. So see, there's truth, but they twist it. And so brother Dave, DFX, Daryl and myself, I think Matthias, I don't know. Sometimes he joins in uh, and Cody will be on there tomorrow night on my channel at 9 p.m. So come and join us. It should be an interesting discussion. We're going to talk about the TULIP doctrine. You know, it's an acronym for uh, total depravity, um, uh, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And so we're going to refute every one of those things because they're all got a grain of truth yep. close to it but so far from the truth because they twist it. Mm -hmm. So I'll see you guys tomorrow night. And I uh, had a great study tonight. And uh, I, I love how much, usually Luke's jumping for joy, but this time we got to see how much his heart is touched and how Jesus is his everything. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you, sister. Um, well, uh, you, you did say, Sister, I think you just misspoke. You said, and we're still on chapter one. Uh, we, we, we're we on chapter oh, two, verse three now. <laughs> yeah, so you, uh, you're always on the wrong chapter. You thought that we were still in, what, chapter three on Galatians for a long time, didn't you? <laughs> we're on chapter three for weeks. <laughs> All right. Um, well, the, the study tonight was uh, very enjoyable. It did fly by, and I, I agree, Brother Cripps. Uh, um, some, sometimes uh, it's uh, that's one of the things about Fridays is we we, we, we go longer and uh, we we never are, are bored and, and out, we run out of things to say. Um, and sometimes maybe it's best to just let the spirit lead you, but then you also have to consider people's lives and their schedules too. So, yeah, that's true. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and. and uh, finish in, in our 90 minute slot tonight but um i will say this about your your talk tomorrow um um i i do disagree with the premise uh that uh, so close and yet so far uh i've heard that a lot lately but um uh, I, I i think that it's it's not even close in in any respect uh I, you could say about roman catholicism for example that it's so close and yet so far because they believe in the, the the Trinity, for example, and they believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, and, and they believe in the virgin birth. They believe in so much. And yet the one thing that that, that really makes the difference is how do I get saved? They they miss that, and that's, that's what makes it so horribly wrong. And yet they got so many other things right. But in Calvinism, I argue that all five points and the foundational point of uh, determinism – uh, is uh, they're completely wrong on everything. It's not even close. So I don't get this uh, so, so close and yet so far. Uh, but um, I would say this. The last time I heard some uh, some of uh, us talking about Calvinism a couple of weeks ago and talking about TULIP, uh, there was a mistake uh, in the very beginning uh, because the T in TULIP is not related at all to the sovereignty of God and, and uh, free will or determinism. The T in TULIP is only related to the God's, to man's inability, man's uh, uh, depravity. Uh, the concept of the sovereignty of God 
and the and determinism and man has no free will that is not part of tulip that's a totally different problem but i would call it the foundational problem of calvinism that that man does not have free will that god controls every thought word and deed uh, this is the main the biggest problem with calvinism because it makes god the sinner and us an innocent puppet um so i i think that uh, make sure you get that right when you're discussing it that the t is not the is not the uh free will issue it all right um other than that uh, thank you everybody in the chat room for uh being with us tonight it, uh, the little bit of, I observed about the chat room, it seemed like everything was very cordial and uh, a wonderful fellowship going on in there. So I'd, I'm happy to see that. So um, let me see. This is uh, Wednesday. So join Renee tomorrow night for her program. And then Friday night on this same channel, 930 Eastern Time, join us for what's it called, Brother Cripps? Fun Fellowship Friday. Fun Fellowship Friday. Yay. I'm sorry, there wasn't much enthusiasm. Fun Fellowship Friday. Yeah, there you go. That proves your acting pipes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, but don't come and join us on Friday unless you're prepared to have a lot of fun. There you go. All right. Okay. Thank you, everybody on the panel. Thank you, everybody in the chat room. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.